I'm Eric Anderson. Tonight on KPBS Evening Edition, a critical response to the shutdown of a North County power plant and customers who are stuck with the bill. <laughs> They've been hosed, and regulators have not only allowed that to happen, but actually encouraged it to happen. The campaign to release more emails connected to the San Onofre shutdown as an investigation continues to figure out what went wrong. Coughing and sneezing, the sights and sounds of flu season hitting San Diego. I'm Amitha Sharma. Health experts weigh in on this year's flu vaccine. Plus, clicks versus bricks. Shoppers flock to the web on Black Friday. The economic snapshot from the start of the holiday shopping season. From magical realism to San Diego, one of Latin America's most widely read authors is on tour now. From her life as an outsider, the inspiration for Isabel Allende's new book. KPBS Evening Edition starts right now. Good evening. Thanks for joining us. San Diego's latest meth report card finds the drug is cheaper, more available, and more powerful than ever before. KPBS reporter Andrew Bowen says methamphetamine seizures at the border have doubled in the past five years. Methamphetamine has been globalized. Officials say the meth coming through San Diego is being cooked in so-called super labs across the Mexican border. They're staffed by university-educated chemists and supplied by big chemical distributors based in Asia. U.S. Attorney Laura Duffy says San Diego's location next to the border makes it especially vulnerable. I believe that one of our primary eradication goals needs to be to help our Mexican government officials disrupt the production of methamphetamine that is coming out of these labs. Dr. Danielle Douglas treats meth users in the emergency room at Sharp Grossmont Hospital in La Mesa. She says the county has to put more resources toward prevention. I believe that this, this country, this, this uh, county is, is not serving our, our patients with psychological disease as well as it could be. And often these patients turn to drugs to alleviate some of the symptoms of their underlying psychological disease, whether that be depression or schizophrenia. That's exactly how James Spellman got hooked on meth in the 1980s. For him, it was a way to deal with his ADHD. I haven't touched crystal meth since 1988, and it bothers me that all these many years later, it's still there. When I see somebody standing in front of me that I know is tweaking, my brain screams, oh God, that used to be me. Spellman still bears the scars from his meth use. He didn't get sober until a particularly violent episode. Two men looking for drugs beat him up while he was sleeping in Balboa Park. Spellman ended up with an abscess on his face. He says the incident saved his life, and if he met the men who hurt him back then, he'd shake their hands to say thank you. Andrew Bowen, KPBS News. World leaders are ready to take on a high-stakes plan to fight global warming. President Barack Obama and 150 leaders are in Paris tonight as part of a climate summit. Participants are calling on governments to put a price on carbon dioxide emissions. Developing countries are seeking cash to help them implement clean energy technologies and policies, and that sets up a tough bargaining atmosphere. But the president says challenges can be overcome. Here in Paris, let's agree to a strong system of transparency that gives each of us the confidence that all of us are meeting our commitments. And let's make sure that the countries who don't yet have the full capacity to report on their targets receive the support that they need. The key to slowing climate change will be improving technology. U.S. officials and allies plan to double Research and development budgets studying climate change over the next five years. Supporters say this could be a lasting legacy for the Obama administration. Critics say that change happens long after the president is due to leave office. 
San Diego's Environment Committee unanimously approved the city's climate action plan proposal today. The measure provides a blueprint for cutting the city's carbon emissions in half over the next 20 years. City Councilman Todd Gloria says the plan addresses climate impacts that threaten the region. This plan demonstrates that San Diego is a progressive leader in addressing climate change and that we value our people, our environment enough to commit aggressive, measurable outcomes in this plan. The climate change plan will go to the full city council later this month. The California Public Utilities Commission is refusing to release more than 60 communications linked to the failure of the San Onofre nuclear power plant. KPBS investigative reporter Amitha Sharma has more signs that the governor was taking sides. San Onofre's brand new steam generators were supposed to last 40 years, but less than one year after they were installed, hundreds of tubes had shown wear, causing a radioactive leak in January 2012. Now, fast forward to May 2013. Senator Barbara Boxer had in her possession two key documents. They showed that Edison officials knew there was potential for premature tube wear before those steam generators were installed, but did not allow for fixes, in part because the company wanted to avoid a rigorous government review. Boxer was incensed. She called on the Justice Department to launch a criminal investigation into whether Edison had lied to federal regulators about what it knew before the faulty equipment was turned on. John Giesman is an attorney for the Alliance for Nuclear Responsibility. At that point, it was clear that things had gone very seriously awry. Giesman says a proper federal criminal probe would have included sworn testimony from the very Edison executives and engineers responsible for managing and designing the steam generators. But Boxer never got that investigation. Correspondence suggests Governor Jerry Brown did not back the California senator and fellow Democrat. Nine days after Boxer called for a criminal investigation of Edison, the company's CEO, Ted Craver, told his board of directors in an email that the governor phoned him. Craver said Brown asked him if he planned to, quote, blast Boxer. Brown's spokesman denies that the governor ever asked Craver that question. Still, Edison's Craver said in the email that he told the governor he would not blast Boxer, but instead planned to, quote, take the high road. <laughs> If that's taking the high road, I'd hate to see what the low road looks like. Giesman laughs because just months before Craver spoke of taking the high road, his colleague at Edison had met in secret in Poland with former California Public Utilities Commission President Michael Peavy. There, the two devised a framework for a settlement that ultimately charged customers $3.3 billion for San Onofre shutdown costs. There are a number of statutes that Edison has quite intentionally violated. The public was never told about that secret Poland meeting. That is, until this January, when a San Francisco judge believed there was probable cause that felonies had been committed. A search of the former PUC president's home turned up notes of that Poland meeting that nearly matched the terms of the deal approved by Governor Brown's appointees on the PUC. The notes included a requirement to end a PUC investigation of what Edison knew about the failed steam generators and when. Giesman says customers have fared poorly. <laughs> They've been hosed, and regulators have not only allowed that to happen, but actually encouraged it to happen. And perhaps even acting as Edison's boosters. In that email from Edison CEO Ted Craver to his board of directors, Craver wrote that he asked Governor Brown if he could tell reporters he thought the company was acting responsibly. Craver wrote, quote, he indicated a willingness to do that. San Diego consumer attorney Mike Aguirre says if that's true, Governor Brown picked the wrong side. What it says is the governor was more interested in keeping the support of Edison than he was in supporting the public's right 
to not be burdened by Edison's mistakes. Meanwhile, a series of bills intended to reform the PUC passed the legislature this year. One would have compelled the PUC to release 65 communications between the regulators and Governor Brown's office regarding San Onofre. But the governor vetoed the reforms, calling them important but technical and conflicting. Amita Sharma, KPBS News. KPBS video journalist Nick McVicker helped produce that story. Near freezing temperatures are expected tonight in San Diego County. The National Weather Service issuing a frost advisory for the valleys and deserts. That will remain in effect until tomorrow morning. Temperatures could end up somewhere between 33 and 38 degrees out in the deserts. We are expecting a gradual warm up, even though there were more chilly nights. Uh, there are more chilly nights in the forecast. 60s and 70s uh, along the coast. You can see the overnight lows there are getting cool. 60s and 70s in the inland valleys as well, with overnight lows in the 40s. Up in the mountains, highs in the 50s and then 60, and then overnight lows in the 30s, and then 60s and 70s out in the desert. Paying for electricity can use up a sizable share of a school district's budget, and many districts are doing what they can to shave power use. Ingrid Lobet with KPBS news partner iNewsSource says this includes the leading edge of a new trend. If you don't run a business, you may not know this. The power company, SDG&E, charges its commercial users differently from renters and homeowners. It takes the highest moment of use during a month. In this example, 627.6 kilowatts and multiplies that times several dollar figures for a total on this one Del Norte High School electric bill of $26,084.14. Some say these demand charges are punitive, but SDG&E says they are essential for keeping at the ready all the power that customer and all their other customers might call on at any time. But these charges are driving the Poway Unified School District and some other local districts to install batteries. The batteries will take over supplying the school with power whenever the school's need is spiking, eliminating those expensive high peaks. A Bay Area company called Green Charge Networks plans to install its battery storage systems at the 10 Poway Unified Schools. The installations come to the schools free because Green Charge gets a portion of the energy savings back from the schools. The company also gets money from a state fund aimed at emerging technologies. Several other San Diego area schools are planning to install battery storage just the beginning of what many expect to be a wave of battery storage. For KPBS, I'm iNewsource reporter Ingrid Lobet. San Diego researchers may be making progress on a cure for cystic fibrosis. They found that they may have a way to target the root cause of the illness. Scripps Research Institution scientists were able to manipulate mutant proteins that cause cystic fibrosis. Researchers say they partially restored the protein's normal function. They're testing to see if the medication is safe for people. Health officials are bracing for a full-blown flu season in San Diego. The county reported the season's first flu-related death earlier this month. County health officials confirmed there have been 123 cases so far. Amitha Sharma has more on what they're doing to keep people healthy. Flu season is here and so are the shots. The big question hanging over us all is whether this year's flu vaccine will do a better job than the shot last year when people got hit by the influenza virus even though they had been inoculated. San Diego County's public health officer, Dr. Wilma Wooten, joins me now to give us some answers. First off, mm -hmm. what's the forecast for this flu season? Is the virus that that's out there expected to be severe, typical, or mild? Well, we can't answer that question. You can never predict what any given flu season is going to look like until the flu season has actually happened. But as of today, CDC uh, is uh, estimating that the vaccine that is available is well matched to what's circulating in the community. So that's what we can tell you today. And what is mm -hmm. circulating in the community right now? Well, right now, there's always uh, influenza. That's uh, been the predominant strain that was circulating last year, uh, H3N2, but there are different variations. And the H3N2 influenza last year was not well matched the vaccine. So far this year, 
uh, but we really won't know in detail until after we get further into the flu season and CDC has collected specimens from around the country from its sentinel sites to actually know exactly what's circulating in the community. Today we can tell you that the specimens we're getting are the influenza uh, A, that H3N2, similar to what's expected. But that's today. Things could change totally in a week or two weeks or over the next few months. What about H1N1, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. the, the swine flu that hit back in 2009, yeah. I believe, and then it kind of made a resurgence a couple of years ago. Does the flu shot provide coverage for that? Uh, yes. The flu uh, vaccines, either an injection or nasal spray, has three uh, viral strains include it if it's a, what we call a trivalent and there are four components in the quadrivalent. So it has two influenza A's which includes the H1N1 which is an influenza A type uh, vaccine and then the H3N2. So two influenza A's and two influenza B's. That's Those are the viruses that are expected to be circulating this flu season but again as CDC collects specimens from across the country, they will know specifically what's actually circulating. So who should get a flu shot mm -hmm. or are you pretty much pushing for everyone to get a flu shot? Uh, all individuals that are six months of age and older should get a flu vaccination, whether it's a shot or a nasal spray. For nasal sprays, uh, that's approved for individuals, healthy individuals that are two years of age to 49 years of age and women uh, cannot be pregnant uh, for the flu nasal spray. So some people call flu shots mm -hmm. a hoax. They mm -hmm. say, look, you know, I get a flu shot and I still get sick. What do you say to that? Well, that's the flu vaccine cannot give you the flu. That's a myth. And it's a, a dead virus in the shots and in the uh, nasal spray. It's what we call attenuated. So it's uh, not an active or live virus. So they can't give you the flu. Uh, uh, itself. It takes two weeks for both preparations to become effective. So you could be exposed to viruses in that interim and there are a lot of other viruses that are circulating that can give you flu-like symptoms. So and people might be exposed to those viruses so they will become infected. And we must also remember that no f vaccine, no matter what it is, is 100 percent. However, if you do if you are exposed to a, the flu uh, when, after you've been vaccinated, if you get it, your symptoms would be uh, less uh, severe. And another point to remember is the vaccine has certain viruses contained, but there could be other viruses that are circulating that you could uh, be infected with. So is the county offering flu shots? We are uh, indeed offering flu, uh, flu uh, vaccinations at our public health centers. Okay, at um, reduced prices or free, what, what exactly is the situation there? In, on any given uh, appointment at our public health centers, one or more uh, vaccinations including the flu is only ten dollars and if you cannot afford to pay then uh, you could still be vaccinated. Okay one really quick question mm -hmm. I've always had this question mm -hmm. why do people tend to get the flu in colder weather? Well it's thought theoretically that in cold weather the nasal mucosa is drier and if it's drier it's uh, fragile so the virus can penetrate the, the nasal mucosa more readily than in the summer months when the nasal mucosa is moist and uh, so that's that's the thought behind it as to why individuals become more infected during the winter months okay yes. dr wooten thanks so much for coming on the program pleasure being here thank you Get ready for some hoop action at San Diego's Petco Park. The ballpark hosting its first ever college basketball game on Sunday. The San Diego State University Aztecs facing the University of San Diego Toreros. An outdoor basketball court was built on Petco Park's infield. The game is the highlight of a week-long festival. Local businesses, schools, and nonprofits will use the court through the week. And it'll give the next uh, generation of scientists, meanwhile, giving the next generation of scientists the tools they need to succeed here in San Diego. San Diego Miramar College celebrating a new science building today. That facility boasting nine labs, an outdoor bio pond, 12 new telescopes, and even a quarter a million dollar mass spectrometer. The new building is expected to receive certification for sustainability. Following up on the bankruptcy of the Hagen grocery chain, Smart and Final.
got the green light to take over 32 Hagen stores, 11 of them in San Diego County. Consumers never warmed up to the out-of-town grocer, which expanded rapidly. The Super Bowl of online shopping is here, but state officials say that Cyber Monday may not be filling up state tax coffers. Sometimes online shoppers aren't charged taxes on their online purchases from out-of-state retailers. State officials want buyers to review their receipts, and if they weren't charged state taxes, California wants people to pay at the end of the year. Shoppers traded bricks for clicks today. Preliminary estimates showing that Cyber Monday earned more than $3 billion in sales. Compare that to sales from Black Friday, which was down from last year to $10 billion. Amitha Sharma shows us how traditional stores are trying to keep up. Cyber Monday is upon us. It's the time when shoppers are enticed online with holiday deals. But is Cyber Monday still really on the Monday following Thanksgiving, or has it eclipsed Black Friday? Here with me to answer that and other questions is Miro Kopik, marketing lecturer with San Diego State's College of Business Administration. Miro, welcome to the show. Hi, Amitha. Thank you. Are more retailers <clears throat> offering online deals on Black Friday rather than waiting until Cyber Monday? You know, retailers have decided they wanted to have a more kinder, gentler Black Friday shopping window. And they've been offering both online and offline deals since after Halloween. But the big push has been this week. So retailers like Walmart on Monday announced all their Black Friday deals and made them available online beginning 12.01 a.m. on Thanksgiving Day. And then later in the day, you could see them in the store and, and shop for them. So how successful was that strategy? I ask because I know that we hear that crowds were thinner at the malls on Black Friday. Is that because people were just, you know, choosing convenience over fighting the crowds? Yes. You know, this time uh, about 103 million people shopped online and about 102 million went in store. Uh, and, and that kind of tipped the balance. This is the first time where more people actually shopped online over the Black Friday weekend, Thanksgiving Black Friday weekend, uh, versus going actually physically in store. So do you expect that trend to continue? I mean, do you ever envision a time where Black Friday might not be that important? At least not for the next decade. Uh, Black Friday is very important. It's still the largest selling day for retailers every year. And what's interesting is that even though 103 million people shopped online, that doesn't mean that they bought online. $12 billion were sold in the stores. Only $4.5 billion were sold online. So most people, what they do when they, when they look online, they, they research, they compare deals, they look at where they want to buy, and then they'll physically go in the store. Because buying, going to buy something is still a social experience, and people like that social experience. So then overall, how did retailers fare on Black Friday? And you mentioned offering deals earlier online, but did, did retailers do anything else in changing their marketing strategy? Well, what they did is by, by kind of offering both the online and offline shopping option, this is a first, and for the first time what they also did, you know, we used to have those big doorbuster specials at 5 in the morning and there was 20 TVs, and when that was done, it was chaos in the store. Now they really actually had substantial inventory, so now consumers can buy it online, they can order online and pick it up in store, or they can go in store and have it shipped to their homes. Retailers have just made the buying experience much easier, and that's very different than the last several years. Okay, and what are the big items on holiday shopping, shopping okay. lists this year? And uh, for, for the holidays, you're looking at big ticket consumer electronics, televisions, game consoles, wearables are a huge purchase item this year, uh, toys obviously, Cyber Monday today is the biggest day for uh, toys, so uh, Star Wars action figures, that's going to sell out sooner than later, and then apparel. Apparel is always a big uh, gifting item during the holidays. And big discounts on these items? You know, this year the discounts are not as aggressive as they were during the recession, so you would used to see 50, 60, 70 percent, you're seeing 30, 20 to 50 percent off. So anything over 35% is actually a very good deal for consumers. And what about shoppers? How much are they opening their wallets this year? Do they have a big budget? I mean, the economy is in better shape now than years past. So, so what's their budget like this year? You know, consumers are expected to spend about $800 per person, which is a, a big lift over last year. They do have a shopping list, which is very interesting because online behavior is very different than in-store. So online, people have a list, they have a mission, they come in, they shop, they look for the best deal, and they're done. In store, what retailers are trying to do is to get that impulse purchase. So if you're buying for your family or friends, 
there's an option I could buy something for myself. And when you see it there, what retailers are doing to entice you this year is they're bundling gift cards with larger purchases. So let's say you buy a TV, you get a $100 or $200 gift card, you can use that in the store right away so you could buy something for yourself. Okay, well, it's a pleasure having you on, Mira Kopik. Thank you so much. Thank you. Isabel Allende was in San Diego today to talk about her new book, Writing and the Topic of Displacement. She's one of Latin America's most widely read authors. KPBS Fronteras reporter Jean Guerrero got a chance to talk with her. Isabel Allende was the guest at an annual author's luncheon held by the San Diego nonprofit Words Alive. Ayanda's new book, The Japanese Lover, tells of a Polish refugee who falls in love with a Japanese gardener in San Francisco. The gardener is forced in, into an internment camp during World War II. Ayanda says she was interested in exploring the topic of displacement because she has always lived as a foreigner. She was a political refugee in Venezuela after the 1973 military coup in Chile and is now an immigrant in San Francisco. She says the refugee crisis in Europe is emblematic of how nations have always responded to immigrants. They are never welcome, but once they integrate, they bring to the country the best they have, and the country is enriched by it. So instead of refusing immigrants, we have to welcome them. Ayanda says she wanted to participate in the Words Alive luncheon because the nonprofit's mission aligns with the mission of her foundation, which empowers marginalized women in part through education and literacy. Words Alive promotes reading among low-income children. Jean Guerrero, KPBS News. You can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thank you very much for joining us. We will be back here tomorrow night. Have yourself a great evening.